right, so let's talk about landlord tenant and why this is in this book. So I think from the last time I was here hanging out with you guys, most of you guys are going into residential sales. There's a couple people who are flirting with the idea of property management. Right there. You are, you are, you're in property She's management now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not flirting with it, I'm married to it. You, you married to it, you married to it, and you're working for a company now, and you're getting your license. Yeah. Fantastic. So this will be all stuff that you know. Near and dear and love. <laughs> now, Megan up front used to work at the clerk's office, so um, before I knew her, she knew exactly who I was because she would see all my paperwork flying through there. Mm -hmm. and she was like, yeah, Chris. Why does anybody ever want to go into property management? I was like, you know what? I don't know. <laughs> um, it, it, it's a little different property management than what you think of as traditional real estate. With traditional real estate, you're typically dealing with a buyer and a seller, or a buyer or a seller, buyer and then sellers. Property management, you're typically dealing with a renter and an owner of the property. And we'll talk a lot about that. Um, and really, there's a couple different things that we need to identify. A lot of paperwork involved in property management. We're going to start off with talking about leases. So who here has ever signed a lease? I know I have. Some people have never signed a lease. That's awesome. Um, leases have dual legal personalities. Now, what does that mean? Um, well, you own it while you using the property? Sort of. Well, remember back in that first chapter, remember when we talked about all the laws that kind of made up the real estate law? There's a lot of property law, and then we got into one of our favorite chapters, which was contract law. One of those chapters that was really, really long and really, really, really exciting to read through. Remember that one? Yeah. Yeah. I think property law is one of the first chapters of the like fundamentals, and then a little bit further on, we get into contract law. Well, leases take their uh, um, take different things from both of those two um, schools of thought or uh, parts of the law. They have a lot of stuff that has to do with property law, which exactly like you said, they grant you some access to property. They'll give you everything. So if you're releasing a house, can you sell that house? No. No. So you have some rights, but you can live there. You have the right of quiet enjoyment still. And then you have contract law, because a lease is essentially a contract between two people. It's a contract between the owner of the property and it's a contract between the owner of the property and whoever's leasing it. Now, the property management company, which is what I do, my leases are my name, but I'm an agent for the owner. So when somebody says, hey, who's your lease with? It's not with myself. It's not with my company. It is with the owner of the property because the owner of the property is the one that is granting that tenant access to live there or some of those property rights, but not all of them. And it's a bilateral agreement. We're both the tenant, who we also sometimes refer to as a leasee, and the owner, who's a leasor, have both rights and duties. Now, when we talk property management, and we'll get into this a lot more probably in the next chapter after the next couple of breaks, we talk a lot about duty. There's a lot of duty in property management. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Very right. Very, Very right. right. Literal, figurative. Yeah. And literal. <laughs> so let's talk about what are some of the rights the tenant has. Quiet enjoyment. Quiet enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So you're allowed to, you know what, use the house, right? Mm -hmm. You lease a house, you lease an apartment, you'd want keys to unlock the door. What else do you want? For it to be maintained. For it to be maintained, yes. You don't want the ceiling falling in on you, you don't want to go sitting on the toilet and have the toilet fall through the floor. Mm -hmm. That happened to one of my tenants last night. Mm. <laughs> For real. I'm sure that was a great phone call. That's yeah, around 11.30 at night. Yeah. I was sitting in the room. I was on the toilet and it fell down. Luckily it was, in the, it was on a crawl space, not a beast. <laughs> I think a general rule of property management is if anything bad is going to happen, it's going to happen at 2 in the morning. Yes. On like a Tuesday or Wednesday night. Yeah. Oh, what are you doing at 2 o'clock? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the Saturday that I first go out of town. Like, yeah. if yeah. I'm out of town for a weekend, like, as soon as I'm, like, out of range or wherever, where I can't, like, do anything about it, that's when, that's when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are some other things? So, with, if you rented a house, would you, like, heat in that house? Yeah. Running water? 
These are all good things. And when I call you, better come and fix it. <laughs> we're going to talk a lot about fit and habitable housing. We're going to talk to make sure that we're meeting different codes and things along those lines. That's something that's expected of a tenant. What are some of the duties? What is something that a landlord or an owner of a property is going to want their tenant to do? Pay. 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 Please. <laughs> what else? That's important. Keep it up. Keep it up. Yeah. What's in the lease? What are they responsible for doing? Are they responsible for cleaning? Are they responsible for mowing the grass? Are they responsible for pest control? Things along those lines. Depending on what's in the lease, there's going to be a whole list of things. When a tenant moves out, what are some of the things that they're expected to do? Leave it all clean up. Leave it the way they found it. Yeah. Put all their trash in the living room and leave. <laughs> I think that's in my lease because that's what my lease yeah. <laughs> is. I don't know, I've got to review my lease and look at it a little bit closer, but I think that's in their suburb because all my tenants follow the lease to the letter of the law. And so I guess it's somewhere in there is like just whatever trash or whatever furniture you don't want, leave it in the middle of the living room and we'll take care of it, no problem. So let's talk about the owner. <laughs> they have rights and duties too. What are some of the rights that the owner has? Lots of times these things are kind of back and forth, so if it's a duty of the tenant, it's typically a right of the owner. Yes, sir? The right to evict. The right to evict. That's correct. So can a landlord just evict for whatever reason they want? No. Now, typically you're going to evict for a couple different reasons. All of my evictions, and it all depends on how the lease is drafted, most of the time you can evict for failure to pay rent or breach of lease. My lease says that if you don't pay rent, you're in violation of the lease. So it's a little bit different with some of the rules that you have to go through with that. Um, pretty much with the notifications you have to send and things along those lines. But we'll talk a lot more about that when we actually start looking at the lease that's in the book, which is the North Carolina Bar Association and North Carolina Association of Realtors lease. That if you guys do decide to be, re join the uh, Board of Realtors, you'll have access to all those forms as well. And our uh, friends at the Realtor Board got together with the friend, our friends at the Bar Association, locked themselves into a room for forever and decided to see how many pages of leases they could write. And they came up with a great, I think it's nine pages now. And I normally have about that many pages of addendums on top of it as well. So um, what is the main thing? If you are owner of property and you lease it to somebody, what's the first thing that you want? What are, what's your number one right? And it's the number one duty of a tenant. Yeah, you have the right to collect rent for this property, 100%. You have some other rights, like you can go in and do inspections, you can go ahead and take possession of the property back through a summary ejectment or eviction if they're in violation of the lease. Um, you have the right to post a for rent sign and show other people if the tenant is given notice to move out or you've given notice to the tenant to move out, things along those lines. So what about the duties of the owner? You're renting a house, heating system goes out, your toilet falls to the floor. What are you, what, what, what's the expectation for you? You're paying your $800 a month. But somebody comes and fixes it. Yes, that the, the house maintains fit and habitability. That, it, mm -hmm. that the owner has to make sure that the stuff that's in the lease that they have to do, that they actually do it. And there's some laws that are, regulate that and things along those lines. So that's kind of like the bilateral aspect of the lease. I mean, bilateral is also kind of goes that um, if one party does not do what they have to do, the other party does not have to continue doing that. That does not just mean that if the tenant stops paying the rent, the owner does not have to fix the house. That does, also doesn't mean that if the owner does not fix the house, the tenant can just stop paying rent. There's a step in the middle where it has to involve the court system. We'll talk a lot more about that property management. So let's talk about leasehold estates. This is what gives the tenant the right to occupy the house. And we're at the top, top of page 326, and that gives us kind of a great little grid that shows all the different types of leasehold estates. <clears throat> so a leasehold estate is also referred to as a non-freehold estate. Because what's a freehold estate? You want to own it? Sure. And you can do what with it? If it's a freehold estate, whatever you want. just about whatever you want. There's some laws in there that probably will prevent you from, I don't know, maybe having a 
nuclear power plant in the middle of Greensboro, or a grow some weed in the back. <laughs> grown some weed in the back. <laughs> Although some of my tenants have not gotten that memo. <laughs> Bring them all to my class. <laughs> Learn a little things. I think for a while there in some neighborhoods, I think that my lease might be different depending on the neighborhood where a lot of people think that it might be okay for illegal drug use and manufacturing and independent pharmaceutical sales. <laughs> I have to double check my lease. Apparently that that's allowed. Um, so at least all the state, you can do some things that you can do in a freehold estate. You have the right to quiet enjoyment, you have the right to live there, you have the right to have guests over, you have the right to um, use the parking space, you have the right to um, maybe change some things if it's in the lease. Let's, lots of times, <clears throat> tenants will ask me, hey Chris, can I paint? What's my first question? Sure. What does the lease say? Yeah. What does the lease say? You gotta paint it back. Same call? Yeah. Paint it back. Mm -hmm. And why do I care about what year it's built if somebody asks me to paint? Lead paint. Because mm -hmm. typically when you're painting, if you're a decent person and you're doing any painting, you spend probably maybe 25% of your time painting and 75% of your time prepping. prepping. <laughs> Somebody's painted before. <laughs> and, and prepping involves <laughs> scraping. scraping, sanding, disturbing painted surfaces. And mm -hmm. so you just don't want somebody who is not lead paint certified you come into a house and start scraping and sanding and creating lead dust everywhere. So we have to look to see what's in the lease. On uh, what amount of things can they do? So a leasehold estate different than a freehold estate. They also refer to leasehold estate as a non-freehold estate. These are words that will probably pop up again. Um, an estate for years. This is a specific start and end. So what document is going to determine what type of leasehold estate a tenant has? I'll give you a hint. Leasehold estate. Contract. Lease. Lease. Lease, yes. So, an estate for year to year is established by a lease and it gives a specific start and a specific end. This is not a very common type of lease or a very common type of leasehold estate. In the leases that you typically sign, and in all of my leases, it is going to be an estate from period to period. This has a specific start and end, plus it automatically renews itself. So Miley says, you know what, you're under contract for a year to two years. After that one year period, you have the option to renew your lease or you have the option to go month to month. And the lease will say that if you go month to month, either party can give you, either party 30 days notice that they want to move out. So I can say, you know what, thank you so much, Tim, for living in my house. You've been great. I understand that you're very popular in the neighborhood with your independent pharmaceutical sales. <laughs> I understand the cops have been out many times, but you're a very good lawyer. However, I believe it is time for our relationship to end, so we're giving you your 30-day notice. Same way the tenant says, you know what, Chris, I've been living in this house for two years and you haven't fixed a thing. I believe that I will be moving out at the end of my lease. Here's my 30-day notice. So, Difference between an estate for years to years and an estate from period to period. Years to years has a specific start and end, but no renewal. Period to period has renewal. An estate at will. This is no specific end, and there's typically no rent. The only time I have ever, ever seen this happen is the same example that the book gives at the top of page 327, where a tenant was in an estate from period to period. They had a standard lease that renewed itself. And then the city said, which is happening right now, we're going to build this great new shiny circular highway that goes around Greensboro. And at some point in time, a bulldozer is going to show up at your front yard and bulldoze your property. <laughs> um, there's a lot of other steps in there, like when the eminent domain comes in, the ownership transfers, all that. But more realistically is the owner says, you know what, as soon as the city actually takes possession of this property and actually transfers the deed from my name to your name, that's when you'll have to move out, tenant. I have no idea when that's going to be. You can stay here until that day and pay no rent. There's going to be some sort of strange situation that is going to cause the owner to either lose possession of the house or the house gets condemned not due to bad condition, but due to another government agency or some reason that that house can no longer be livable in and we don't know exactly when that's going to happen. That is the only time I've ever had that happen. That is extremely rare, and I would never, ever, ever, ever agree to any of that. It just creates too much of a liability on myself as a property manager, and it creates just an uncertain situation for the tenant. But um, that is a type of leasehold estate, so it's in there. 
So in a stated well is no specific end time, typically no rent, there's some sort of external factor which is creating a weird situation. Typically like eminent domain is coming through and the owner has already agreed to sell the property and they're just waiting for that property transfer to happen. Then we have an estate at sufferance. And the key word here is suffer. This is where the tenant has no legal right to be there. And so when I was in the class and I was reading this, I was like, well, that sounds a lot like trespassing to me. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Trespassing is when a tenant or a person never had any legal right to be in a piece of property. Somebody breaks into a house just to hang out, that's trespassing. However, the state of sufferance is, is that at some point in time, they were either one of these, typically in a state from period to period, because that's a typical residential lease. And then, due to a violation of the lease or something else, the landlord has taken that tenant to court. And the court and the magistrate or judge has said, you know what, landlord, you're correct. This tenant did violate their lease. I'm going to go ahead and grant you possession of this property back. And we'll go through that wonderful, wonderful quick and easy and inexpensive process. Those are all sarcastic terms. It's very long, it's expensive, and it's a pain in the butt process to evict somebody. But the judge has said, you know what? You're right, property owner, the tenant has violated the lease, you get possession of the property back. And after that happens, then that um, tenant moves from an estate from period to period to a state that suffers. However, they still are there. And what they're waiting for is the owner of the property to file court papers with the sheriff, which is what Megan used to do at the clerk of court. I used to go to Megan and say, hey, here's my court paper, here's my money. And then she would go ahead and process that in the computer, send some of the paper, go to the sheriff's office. And then the day after that, uh, Deputy Lunsford, the Guilford County Sheriff's Department, pick up the phone, call me and say, hey, Chris, Lunsford, yep, we're padlocking this house at this date at this time. Please be there 10 minutes before me. I say, okay, great. See you there. Bye. So during that time frame, where that person is still there, but has lost their legal right to be there, they are in a state of sufferance. There, there's suffering happening there. <laughs> so these are the four major types of leasehold estates. And there's, again, just to recap, this is the tenant's right to occupy. So anything that's for years has a date of ending and it's not renewable. It's not renewable. You see that sometimes in commercial leases. Um, I have heard, I have not seen <coughs> leases, but folks in the class have said that they used to work for, they used to be a leasing agent in an apartment complex where they were, for whatever reason, the management or this uh, corporation that owned the apartment complex said, we do not want any month to month leases. And so all their leases were written as an estate for years. Because typically an apartment complex lease will say, you know what, it'll automatically renew itself. And then you'll get a handy dandy letter saying if you want to go month to month, your rent's going to go from $600 a month up to $700 a month. Because apartment complex is like for you, or actually all landlords like for you to be under um, a lease just because it locks you into a certain time frame. But I'm somewhat flexible with some of my uh, tenants who are real good. I'll let them go month to month after that. But yes. Typically, a state for years to years, I see it very, very, very rarely in residential leases. Any other questions? So let's talk about different types of leases. Oh, we're cruising along nicely. I know this is very exciting. Yeah, everybody needs to get that second cup of coffee. I know I do. Uh, types of leases. We have fixed leases. These also can be referred to as flat leases or gross leases. This is your typical, typical residential lease where the landlord pays taxes, insurance, and maintenance, and the like. So what does that mean? Taxes. What are taxes in this situation? Property taxes. It would be very strange for you as a tenant to all of a sudden get a $1,500 bill from your landlord saying, oh, by the way, my property taxes are due. You go ahead and take care of this for me. And you as a tenant would be like, oh, hmm. Go ahead and get out my what? Go ahead and get out my lease and see where in my lease did I miss that I am paying an extra fifty dollars. Missed, <laughs> missed it. Again, I said it's not a, it's not a short document. Um, insurance. We we'll talk a little bit about insurance later on, but let's talk a little bit about this now, just to get our minds energized about insurance. Remember, 
Renters insurance. Renters insurance. Who's responsible for that? Is it required? Does it mean it's, it's, it's not a requirement? It's not a requirement. But it can be. It can be. Oh, yeah. Why do property managers want? She's thought here said yes. Property. Yes. Yeah. Renters insurance. Yes. Good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Apparently, renters insurance is a good idea because then if you have something like a water leak in their personal property is damaged, then they can't call you and say, well, you know, this leaked and like my, like I had a water supply line burst a couple weeks ago, yep. and this tenant has renters insurance. But she still called me and was like, well, what are we going to do about my couch and my recliner and all this stuff got damaged? And I was like, well. You know, that's your renter's insurance, not me. So. Is that required, though? Is no, we don't require it. Uh, we encourage it. Yeah. But if there's nothing in our lease that requires. I require it on my mind. You do? Yep. I switched about two years ago. I used to have a little addendum that uh, I drafted and had my lawyer approve. Because, again, I can't draft documents to be addendum to lease because I can't <laughs> practice law in the state of North Carolina. I don't, I'm not a lawyer. I only play one on TV. <laughs> um, but uh, why I switched was I was in small claims court, and I had a, wasn't my case, but I was sitting there patiently waiting for my case to be heard. And I was actually very surprised at the outcome of this. I had a landlord who had negligently failed to repair a, a leaking bathtub, and it was a two-story townhouse, I believe. And um, the bathtub actually fell through the floor and smashed the TV crew in a huge water leak, huge water bill. The landlord had been notified in writing for three months in a row that the um, tub had been leaking around the sides, that there was definitely a water leak, they were seeing water stains on the ceiling, um, that the floor was that. I mean, the tenant did the right thing, was sending certified letter after certified letter to the landlord. The landlord did nothing. However, the um, magistrate ruled in favor of the tenant saying, no, you, do not, weren't res you aren't responsible for the rent for the time that you were in the house. However, the tenant was also asking for about $4,500 worth of personal property. But in the tenant's lease, they were required to have renter's insurance. Yeah. Even though the landlord was negligent in not repairing the house, the tenant's res it was the tenant's responsibility to have renter's insurance. And the uh, judge said, well, if you, do you have renter's insurance? And the tenant said, no, I don't. Landlord, and the um, magistrate was like, well, if you did, I would rule in your favor for the amount of your deductible, and your renter's insurance would be uh, cover the rest. However, because you did not do what you said you were going to do in the lease by getting renter's insurance, I'm not awarding you anything for your personal property. Wow. I was very surprised on that, too. But that's what the magistrate ruled, is that is what the law is. Even though the tenant did everything right, except they didn't pay their ten dollars a month of renters insurance or fifteen dollars a month. So who here has ever had renters insurance? Awesome, fantastic. Ten dollars, fifteen dollars, six dollars, twelve ninety-five. It's like twenty-five thousand dollars in coverage. Yeah, it was very cheap. Yep. Um, Actually, last week when I was in this class, right when I was leaving a house that I managed in the uh, in a beautiful part of High Point, um, caught fire. Oh, no Lord. Um, no, they weren't. Um, there are some questions on what caused it. The house was built in like the, I mean, the late 30s, early 40s, so it had some old wiring in there. But it looked like from the fire investigator that a... Um, surge protector from an outlet strip was plugged in and they had two irons and a TV and something else plugged into one outlet. And it, it was just too much. And there's, see, that, that, that could have been it, but they said just the outlet was old and the wiring was old. And the tenants lost, I don't know, probably, probably two or three thousand dollars worth of stuff. The biggest thing was is the kid, they had a 17 year old kid and he had all his football equipment piled up right there on top of the uh, surge protector uh -huh. and the helmet burned and the shoulder pads burned and all that. Luckily it was the school's property, but I don't think <laughs> the school was very happy about that either. So they were asking for us to reimburse that. And I said, well, oh, here's the lease. Where's your renter's insurance? Luckily they did have renter's insurance. So that was nice. But yeah, that's how I spent, because I, I taught the evening class, so I, that's how I spent my three hours in between classes. <laughs> Standing out in the rain, talking to the fire inspector, and waiting for the owner to show up. And I was like, yeah, that burned. I think he was actually not too disappointed with that. 
think he had that house well insured as well. So, <laughs> so yeah, renters insurance. Uh, what other types of insurance are there? So yeah, your regular fire and casualty insurance. Who would pay for that insurance typically? The owner. The owner. So there's got to make sure we understand when we're talking insurance in leasehold estates, we got to understand that there's two different insurance policies. Because let's say that the hurricane comes through, a tree falls on a house, water comes in, damages the tenant's property. Will the homeowner's insurance policy, that casualty and fire insurance, cover any Thing that does not belong to the owner. No, uh -uh. no not unless there is a add-on to that policy saying, hey, yes, I want to cover this. What about dog bites? When we're talking about insurance. Dog bites? Dog bites. <laughs> Liability insurance does, but what are insurance companies in the business of doing? <laughs> Receiving and not giving. <laughs> That's their business model. Because, you know, we're going to collect insurance premiums from everybody, and we're going to not give all that money back. And the difference between those two numbers is how insurance companies make money. So, one of the creative things they've done is the insurance companies have paid out a lot of money for dog bites. So, the insurance company says, you know what, we will still cover pets, but we're going to give you a list of breeds of dogs and types of pets that we are not going to cover. And that's the dangerous breed list, which about 95% of my owners that I represent right now, I've gotten them on board with the no pet policy. Because I'm not an expert in dog, and I can't tell you if your 250-pound pit bull is actually a pit bull. I don't know. But I know that most homeowners, most insurance policies for rental properties now will have a dangerous breed exclusion built in where if a dog bites somebody on the premises and it's one of these breeds of dogs, they're not covered. We're not paying the dog. Which is tricky. And so that's pretty much, this change probably happened around 10 years ago, I want to say. Maybe mm -hmm. 10 to 8 years ago, I don't know if you've got, if your insurance on your apartment complex is similar to that that you guys work at or Generally, all of our leases have no pet policy. Yep. Um, with some of our elderly communities, we will allow pets, but mm -hmm. generally it's limited to like a cat or like a small breed dog. We don't do larger breeds like pit bulls, German shepherds, or anything like that. Right. So, but yeah. generally, we're all no pets. Yeah, I've got a, there's a couple owners that are dog people that, I, that we have like 25 pound yeah. total pet pound limits because that's. That's very easy for me to say, and I, I, I've met some great pit bulls and some great wop in my years, and I've met some just terrible ones. So I can't really blame the dog as much as I can blame the owners on those, but I've never met a 25-pound wop or a 25-pound pit bull, so I can pretty much say that if your dog is 25 pounds, I can say that's not a Rottweiler and that's not a pit bull. It's not a German Shepherd. It's not an Akita. It's not a Doberman. It's not a wolf, it's not a <laughs> whatever, whatever else, it's not a, it's not a, what did I hear, somebody said that they had an emotional support pig the other day, oh. and I, yeah, I saw the emotional support squirrel, I'd be like, yeah, that, that's one thing, um, yeah, emotional support iguana, there was a case study, and I was trying to find it before class, but I couldn't, where somebody in Florida had an emotional support alligator. Oh, oh, I don't know. She's probably. Do they have to have paperwork for emotional support animals, or is it just you just? You just throw a vest on them and says they're Yes, and that, but that is super, super like it's walking through a field of landmines. Yes, it's a lot easier than you would think for somebody to be able to go. Okay, well, you know, I have this issue or that issue, and I need a doll or I need a. Iguana or, you know, a crocodile. crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some form of obscure animal. It's easy. easy yeah, um, we talk about the ADA, and I refer, I, I call them more often than I would like to, just because I, I can't even ask somebody, well, why do you need this emotional support animal? Mm -hmm. I can ask for documentation, but I think even if they don't give it to me, I don't think I can exclude 
include them as an applicant, um, I think I have to still allow them to move in and then give them a certain time frame to produce documentation to me. And I don't think that I can evict them for that either. Um, and so it's, I, I just call the ADA and say, hey, this is my situation. I don't want to be sued. What do I do? And they say, okay, this is what you can do. Can you put no emotional support animals on them? No. Can you put no animals? Uh, you put no pets. No pets. Put no pets, but, but an emotional matter. support animal and a service animal are not pets. Service animals, very, very, very easy to tell what a service animal is. Yeah. Yeah. They are well behaved. They sit. They listen. They don't. They don't wag their tails a lot. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be a larger dog, and they're going to have a harness. They're going to have paperwork that is with them, on them, and the vest, and all that. And they are going to act very differently than any other pet that you've ever seen. However, an emotional support animal could be a squirrel, could be a tarantula, it could be a monkey, or a highly untrained UPQ chihuahua. <laughs> it, it happens. That is you name it. That's so specific. Uh -huh. I want to ask another question about that. Yes, please. <laughs> so, do you, um, like, say, for instance, if, if someone has an emotional support animal or um, What's the other thing called? Uh, a, service a service animal. animal. Yep. Do they have to pay pet fees and pet rent? No, those? cannot charge them up because it's not a pet. It's a, it's a, um, it's a way to get over. Yeah, so that and insurance. It's good that we have this conversation. We need to understand all the different types of insurance. So it, I, what I can do is I can say, well, you know what? Our insurance for this house does not cover your emotional support animal. Um, can you please make sure that your renter's insurance provides us coverage for that? I can't ask them that. I cannot disclude them from housing because I cannot treat somebody with a situation, let me see if I can phrase this correctly, a situation that requires them to have an emotional support animal. I cannot exclude that person from housing because then I'm in violation of fair housing. So if I say no emotional support animals, it's like me saying uh, no people with PTSD are allowed in my property or no blind people are allowed in my properties, or other things, which that, that, that's real clear cut. You know, Chris, you can't say no blind people are allowed to look at your properties. Same way, I can't say no service animals or no emotional support animals. I can say no pets. Everybody good on that? Mm -hmm. Fair housing is a big deal. Um, maintenance, so I think we've got a pretty good idea of what maintenance is. In some of my leases, I have that the tenant's responsible for some maintenance. Tell me something that a tenant should be responsible for in a lease. Batteries and smoke <laughs> That's my number two one. What's my number one? Air filter. Air filter. We get a gold star. This extra smiley face. <laughs> if tenants were just to do one thing and one thing only in my world, if they would just change their air filter out once a month, I, when somebody moves in, I even buy them air filters. I put six of them right there, right by it. So when they move in, they got them. It takes 20 seconds to do it. Um, <laughs> I'm they're never taught about I show them. You gotta do the little latches. You pull it down. Old one out, new one in. You know. they, don't, they, don't, they don't understand. But I always get the call. Oh, Chris, my heat's not working. All right, send my HVAC guy out there. And pull the air filter out. It's like it starts off this thick and then all of a sudden ends up this thick. And it's oh. and no air is passing through there, so they burn the motor out because yeah. the motor is trying to blow air over the heating coils. Can't move any air over it. And, I'm like, mm -hmm. and then I go in there and I look at the little closet that's right next to it. And I say, I pull out the big pack and I six pack of air filters that are in there. Can you write oh, no, that? I buy the cheap ones. Can you write okay. that in the lease? I do. Oh, it's 100% my lease. It's, it's in the lease, it's in my maintenance addendum. For a while, I think I even had a separate air filter addendum because it gotten so bad. But um, <laughs> yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. The natural intersection with the tenants so that the landlords are responsible for that, like just natural. So I think that's one of the things. But I mean, it saves so much money on your heating and AC bills if you change it out. But anyway. We'll get off that topic. Other things with maintenance, some of my leases. Yes, sir. I have a weird question. Sure. So I just recently at um, at one of my friend's apartments and everything, and her like her like apartment got shot. Okay. Like, like from the top floor. So somebody inside another unit yeah, shot, shot down, down through the ground. Yep. Okay. Yes. 
She has like three holes, right? It's like one in the kitchen, one in her room, and one that hit her. Um, She's still there? Yeah. Oh, wow. One that wow. hit her. Uh, wow. One that hit her like dryer for her clothes and everything. Okay. But they're saying if she tries to cancel her lease, she's gonna have to pay extra. Mm -hmm. They're trying to move her to like one apartment over. Okay. She's cool. trying to get out of the lease. Out of the to a building. Um, she can probably get out of that <laughs> lease if she can show that the landlord is somehow is the person who did the shooting still there. Yeah. Yeah. So she can probably go to the whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, it's not the guy who was living there. It was like a friend who came over. Yeah. And they just ended up like. But in terms yeah. of it's like the yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I would have I stopped. I had a tenant. Well, a ten, in my lease, and it, it all be depends on how the lease is written. Mm -hmm. My lease says that the tenant's responsible for the conduct of their guests. So that tenant would be responsible for repairing that. Mm. Uh, my son as a property manager would call the police and get a police report and see if we can track down who actually pulled the trigger on this gun. I would probably also evict the person. I had a single family living in a three bedroom house in Shannon Woods. This was probably less than a year ago. And the Adult son was visiting, and he had some friends over, and somebody shot a gun, and it went up through the went up through the ceiling. Nobody got injured, minimal damage to the house, and go through the roof. I think it was like roll twenty two or something. But the neighbors called the police. I let the family stay there, but we signed a new lease saying that that adult son who you know, wasn't the wasn't the person who pulled the trigger, the, the police found who pulled the trigger, found the gun, all that stuff, arrested the person for I don't know what they I think. Property damage and discharging a firearm within city limits, I think, is what he was charged with, which I don't I think he probably paid fifty dollars and cross the courts and move along. I think he got his gun back. Um, which I was very confused about that. But I let the family stay there by putting a lease that the adult son who had the gas was never allowed, is not allowed on the property or else he'd be trespassed. So I was able to do that and I thought that was keeping my duties as a landlord to keep my area secure. In apartment complexes, it's very different. If, I, if that was a multifamily house, I probably would evict them to cover my liability to say that, because let's say you, you're you living you're living in the unit below, and <clears throat> say, hey, you know what, my house just got shot. You sent a letter in writing to me saying, hey, Chris, I don't feel safe here, I wanna move out. I said, you know what, I, I as the landlord have taken necessary precautions to ensure your safety. And I would let that person stay there, and the next week, that person invites somebody over with a gun again and shoots down through the floor again, and you get shot. Mm -hmm. Then I have some liability that I have been uh, negligent. I have been willfully negligent as my duty as a landlord to ensure the safety and security of the premises. The same way if somebody calls me and says, "Hey, my front door lock isn't locking," I have a duty as a landlord to go ahead and fix that lock so it can be secure, or I can be held liable if. Within a certain amount of time, like if I get a call at midnight that my block isn't broken and then I get out there the next, get within 24 hours to fix it, but the tenant says, oh yeah, well, 10 minutes after you called me, somebody stole my TV. No, you're not going to get that back, but in a reasonable time frame. Right. So I would probably evict that person in multifamily just because that liability is greater. In single family, um, I was able to keep that family there because I don't think they had any idea that the adult son's friend had a gun, and I think they were just being stupid 20-year-olds. Um, but yeah, in your situation, I'm not a lawyer, so I cannot give her legal advice, but I would probably tell the apartment complex that you are breaking the lease if that person above them does not move out, and that, she, that she's all set and prepared to go to court because of that. And really where the push would come is whether or not she can get her security deposit back if she moved out and whether or not the apartment complex puts um, that on her credit. Mm -hmm. part, in my role, typically, if you break your lease, I charge you one month's rent. Um, most multifamily apartment complexes will charge you the entire duration of the lease. So if you're there for six months, you're paying $1,000 a month, they will say, okay, well, to break your lease, it's going to be $6,000. Talk a lot more about that later, but it's also going to be where that apartment complex should then refund the person back that amount 
after it gets re-rented less, the time it was vacant, the re-renting cost, and damage. Um, so let's continue on, unless there's any other questions about maintenance, who's responsible, um, all that good stuff. All right, good. Percentage leases. This is uh, typically in the retail world. It includes the small base amount plus a percentage of gross or net income. We'll get to do a math in a little bit. Uh, then we have a net lease where the tenant pays some or all of the property expenses. So a net lease is very different than the fixed lease. Those are kind of two opposite sides. And we'll hear triple net, 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 or tie cam. What do those things stand for? How much expenses they pay? Three things. Triple net. Tie cam. What does tie cam stand for? You got it. So you rent a space at a strip mall, you're paying the taxes or a portion of the taxes on that, a portion of the insurance on that, and a portion of the common area maintenance. So common area maintenance would be landscaping, um, cleaning the parking lot, trash disposal, things along those lines. Why does that work in commercial but not so much in residential? Or why is it more common in commercial and not so much common in residential? Right, because it's business. Are there a lot of rules governing residential, Residential Rentals and Renters Agreement Act? If you read the book, you probably had a wonderful three or four pages on that. Did you see the uh, Commercial Renters Act? How you can not no, you didn't. You want to know why? Because there's not, there's not the, the amount of rules that are involved outside of zoning, the amount of rules that are involved for residential is much thicker than it is for commercial outside of zone. Zoning is out of the scope of everything, um, but yeah. Um, a graduated lease, this increases at set intervals. An index lease increases or decreases. Uh, ground lease is land and building are separate. What does that mean? You lease the land yeah. for 99 plus whatever. And then you build the building to... Who builds the building? You as the owner. The, the, owner, owner, the, the one that's leasing the, the place. The tenant. Yeah. So, right. So at the end, I guess once in 99 years, kind of you have to leave and leave the building behind. <laughs> <laughs> so let's give an example of that, because that one's always one that gives a lot of questions. If you own, say, 25 acres, and a great new shiny highway is coming through, and there's going to be a great new shiny exit right there. And you get a call from your good friends at Walmart and say, you know what, this will be the perfect location for us to build a new Walmart. So you say, oh, great, you know what, I've had this land for a while. I knew it was always going to work out for me. Jackpot. So Walmart says, you know what, here's $275,000. I'd like to buy this piece of land. You call your CPA up, and your CPA is like, no, no, you do that right now. You only pay seventy four thousand dollars for that. You'll have two hundred thousand dollars worth of income, with taxable income, and it'll put you in a different tax bracket. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. You say, okay, call Walmart back up. Like, hey, Walmart, I'd love to be in business with you, but my CPA told me not to sell due to my specific tax situation. Walmart's like, okay, great. Yeah, let's do a uh, ground lease. And you're like, okay, cool. We'll yeah, we'll lease the uh, land for you for five hundred dollars, eight thousand dollars, seven million dollars per year. Whatever that, I don't know, whatever, whatever they want to do. However, we're not going to sign a five-year commercial lease. Typical commercial leases are three to five years. Why isn't Walmart going to want to sign a three-year lease on that? Right. So how much is it going to cost for them to build a Walmart? A lot. Millions, probably. Now, can at the end of those five years, you now had a nice piece of land, now it has a big, big giant Walmart on it. Can Walmart easily pick that Walmart up and drive it to the next piece of land if you decide, you know what, Walmart, this has been cool, but I'm not going to renew your three-year lease. Sorry. <laughs> so what Walmart does is, okay, well, the functional life of our building is going to be 85 years. We want to make sure that we have a lease in place for at least 85 years. Typically, they're for 99 years or 100 years or for, I've even seen an example where they signed a lease for 1,000 years. The lease just goes on and on and on and on and on. However, is that lease going to be a fixed lease 
or is it going to be some sort of graduated lease or an index lease? It should be graduated because you don't know what the economy is going to be like in 20 years from now. You don't know what the cost of land is going to be in 20 years from now. You're going to want to say, you know what, $500 today is, you know what, $500. $500 in 25 years from now, not the same amount of money, is it? So you want to make sure that that amount that you're charging the lease, because they are such for such a long amount of time, changes. Either graduated, which increases at set intervals, or based on an index, such as maybe the consumer price index or the gross domestic product. I mean, Walmart sales are very, very tied into the economy. Um, then we have oil and mineral leases, which is cash plus a percentage of what they pull out of the ground. So let's say you own a nice big piece of land in Alaska and somebody discovers gold mine. Sweet. Let me go ahead and pack all my stuff up. I'm going to become a gold miner. Does that sound realistic? No. no. Great. Gold mining R us gives you a call and says, hey, I understand that you've got some gold in your land. We would love to mine that. You're like, fantastic. <laughs> Let's do it. I have no experience in mining. And gold miners R us says, you know what we do? We've got 75 gold mines. Here's the Here's some references of people we've used. Our typical lease is going to be an oil and mineral lease, which is we will give you $500 a month to access your property, plus you'll get 5% of what we pull out of the ground, 10% of what we pull out of the ground. Now, there's a certain amount of trust that's involved in percentage leases and oil and mineral leases. What is that? That they disclose how much they actually buy. Yes. There has to be some sort of check and balance there. With a retail percentage lease, typically you'll have access to the accounting software that they'll use or to their CPA where whatever goes through the register automatically gets put into a computer system which goes to an accountant, which then the accountant has some responsibilities to do the right thing. And then you just get a copy of that report and that's how they determine how much rent is there. Um, for oil or mineral, same thing. There has to be some sort of check and balance because you don't want all the miners walking off of the gold mine with the pockets full and then not going into whatever system is there to make sure that all the oil and minerals or whatever is pulled out of the ground is recorded properly. And then last but not least is your full service lease. This is where the uh, landlord controls just about everything um, and includes that in the lease amount. This is very typical in like indoor shopping malls or friendly center maybe does a little bit of this, but biggest thing is is the mall does not want to, if it's a 250 store mall, they don't want every night 250 cleaning crews coming to the mall. They don't want 250 different maintenance guys coming through to change the light bulbs and put up signs. They want to say, you know what, it's part of your lease, we're going to include cleaning of your store, we're going to include side maintenance on the outside, we're going to include X, Y, and Z, because they do not want each store having a different cleaning person walking through that mall late at night because they want to control the access. They want to make sure all the signs are up to standards of the mall. They want to make sure it's a consistent feel throughout that. These are the different types of leases. We have made it through the first 50 minutes of fun of landlord and tenant. <laughs> And when we come back from break, we are going to separate into groups of landlords and small business owners. And we're going to do a uh, little example on commercial lease negotiations, which is tons of fun. Enjoy your break. See you in 10 minutes.